Well, thanks for the introduction. And uh, my name is Søren uh, Andersen, and I'm from uh, DTU. So I'll present this work that uh, that we've been doing together with uh, Emily Hudson, Anton uh, Massen, and Frederick uh, Peterson, as well as uh, Tufe uh, Gritsman, who's uh, probably also in the call now. So really what we wanted to look at is, uh, is the uncertainty of toggling when we want to do uh, wake steering uh, experiments. And we all know that that happens under different atmospheric conditions where we have a, lar a lot of uncertainty. So we really wanted to try and, and leverage what we can do with LES to, uh, to dig into this uncertainty. So the underlying motivation, which I guess most of you here know is that basically if we talk about the benefits of wind farm flow control, it becomes a, a relative term. And it's very often where we're, where we're talking about this control scenario uh, compared to a baseline scenario. And one of there's different ways we can do this. Uh, one of them is sort of an on off actuation where we uh, steer or yaw the turbines to steer the wake. And then we uh, turn off yaw uh, to sort of have a, a baseline. And that's what we call toggling this on and off uh, actuation. We also ha have uh, other um, ways of doing uh, experiments. That could be a side by side comparison where we have two turbines in a farm, for instance, that have the same. Uh, conditions and then we we uh, we control one of them and then have the other one as a reference but that has its own complication in terms of secondary effects spatial uh, uncertainties etc so here we're just going to focus on toggling and the underlying assumption when we when we do toggling in the field is basically that we assume similarity of the flow and other environmental parameters between controlled and baseline and if we look at the the sort of toggling frequency in, in literature, it sort of ranges from uh, relatively short periods of 35 minutes to several days. But really what we want to, uh, <clears throat> what we want to try and get closer to here is what is the, rec what is the correct uh, baseline? So essentially, how do we compare statistics if it's not obvious what is the correct baseline or if we, don't even, if we cannot even uh, obtain a correct baseline? So we're going to do this with uh, with LES. Uh, I won't go too deep into it, but uh, we're going to use Ellipsis 3D, uh, which is a code here at the DTU. It's finite volume and incompressible. It's multi-grid and multi-block. It's highly parallelized using MPI. And for these studies, we use the Deardorf uh, subgrid scale model. We also assume uh, monin obukov similarity theory for the non-neutral cases. And then our uh, turbine, uh, we're going to model that using an actuated disk which is fully coupled to Flex 5. So we have a controller and the, the blades are uh, deflected, et cetera. We're going to model uh, three different atmospheric conditions. So we're gonna sort of have the three uh, main categories. We have conventional neutral boundary layers, uh, stable boundary layer and convective uh, boundary layer. So all of them are driven with a geostrophic wind of 9.5 uh, meters per second, the same roughness of 0 0.001 uh, meter. We have an initial uh, temperature of 277, and then we have different uh, initial temperature profiles and different cooling and surface heat fluxes. Um, that also means that our simulation time is quite different for the different uh, simulations. So the conventional and neutral boundary layer was run for 27 uh, hours to sort of uh, reach statistically stationary conditions. Whereas both the stable and the convective, they don't reach uh, statistically stationary. So they, they, uh, uh, we have run them for 10 and five hours respectively, but they will essentially continue to, uh, to develop. And that's part of the, what we want to test with this uh, study. <clears throat> the mesh used here is uh, four by four kilometers. And then the vertical uh, extent uh, differs between the three different uh, atmospheric conditions uh, relative to essentially the height of the surface layer. We have a refined region around the turbine of plus minus 5R, where we have resolution of just under 3 meters, which correspond to, uh, to 16 cells uh, per radius. Um, the atmospheric boundary layer conditions, they are based on a study that uh, Emily Hudson did together with, uh, with our colleagues uh, at EPFL. So they compared the um, ellipsis 3D against the wire code from EPFL. I won't go too much into the detail, but here's uh, sort of the, the, the velocity profile, the TKA profile, and the temperature profile for the three different atmospheric conditions. And we're going to use the, basically the red line that I have circled here. So, so you can see that 
for the three different uh, condition, conventional, neutral, stable, and, and convective, we have a hub height velocity of around 8.5 meters. We have uh, turbulent intensities ranging from uh, 3% to 15%. And then there's a standard deviation in the local wind speed at the, at the hub height, ranging from plus minus three degrees to plus minus uh, seven degrees. So this talks about some of the differences in variability for these different atmospheric um, conditions. So basically, we're going to run these uh, atmospheric uh, boundary layers and then with, on and off with the control. So our control uh, scenarios will be yawing uh, the turbine uh, minus 10, minus 20, and minus 30, and then compare it to, uh, to zero degrees. We have a total uh, simulation time of 90 minutes after we have discarded the initial transient where the wake uh, develops throughout the domain. So we'll basically have flow uh, that looks something like uh, what you see here on the bottom where it is a uh, time average uh, wake uh, profiles. We're gonna use uh, a concept that we use quite a, a lot where we introduce uh, ghost turbines in our numerical domain. And that basically means that we, that we insert uh, turbines uh, behind uh, and our actuator disc. These turbines are also running fully covered with, uh, with Flex 5. Uh, so that means we get all the deflections and, and power production, et cetera, of the turbines, but we don't have any forces uh, fed back into the, into the flow. That's why we call them ghost turbines. So they're, they're sort of operating in the flow, but they're not affecting the flow. That also means that they don't create a wake and they don't have induction in them. So we need to correct this when we are comparing their power, for instance. <clears throat> so we really want to uh, to compare these uh, the statistics for toggling for different atmospheric conditions and we sort of set up two different uh, scenarios for this statistical comparison so first off i'll show some um, some results where we have what, what we call idealized so basically that is that we know everything les is ideal because we can sort of run the same scenario twice with everything uh, the same except one change in our parameter, in this case, the, the yaw angle. And therefore, we can compare the relative power gain of two uh, turbines uh, as this uh, ratio here, where we basically compare what is the power of the first turbine plus the power of the second turbine at a certain distance. So the ghost turbines allows us to compare at different distances for a given uh, yaw angle of the front turbine. And that ratio we, we take relative to, uh, to the baseline where the first turbine is not going. And we do this statistics on 10 minute uh, basis. So we can discuss that uh, afterwards. <clears throat> so that looks something like this. So this is a plot of uh, box plots where we have the power gain on the Y axis and we have the downstream distance on the X axis. We have the three colors where blue corresponds to minus 10 degree yawing of the first turbine green is minus 20 and red is minus uh, 30 degrees. So these box plots essentially gives us the distribution of our power gains. And you can see that basically they tend to peak. For, so for instance, the minus 30 degree peaks at around a gain of almost 30% power gain at around three diameters downstream. The Minus 20 has a smaller peak and it's shifted a little bit. So that peaks around four diameters downstream at around 10 to 15 uh, percent power gain. And finally, the, the minus 10 degrees peaks probably around five or six somewhere here uh, and has a much uh, smaller gain, but up to uh, five percent or so. So generally, our power gain is positive or above uh, one. Um, and particularly, this is for, for shorter spacings. But as we move further downstream, there is some uncertainty or some outliers for very for the small uh, yaw angles where we might not always uh, have power gains. So that was the conventional neutral boundary layer um, simulations. But uh, as I mentioned, we also have for the stable and the convective. So I've combined them here in a very busy slide, perhaps. But we have the conventional neutral that we just went through on the left hand side and the stable in the middle, where we can see that the trends are very similar. A higher yaw angle on the first turbine gives us a large power gain that peaks around three or four diameters downstream. The peak of minus 20 is uh, delayed a little bit and a little bit reduced, but we still, for this case, get uh, power gains of 25 to 30%. And then for our minus 10 degrees, we have 
uh, now always a gain and it peaks around five diameters. However, when we go to, to look at the convective boundary layer, we see that we uh, only have gains in the near wake uh, and otherwise we have uh, substantial power losses up to about 10% for most uh, distances. We also can see with, uh, with these box plots that uh, our distributions are typically wider for our conventional neutral and for our convective boundary layer. Uh, and I guess that's uh, quite uh, expected since the stable is very sort of, uh, it's not as turbulent and, and everything is more uh, uh, controlled. So that was the idealized one, but in reality, we cannot do this because in reality, if we want to do experiments out in, in the atmosphere, we don't know everything. So what we want to do is also to uh, compare these statistics from a realistic perspective. And this is uh, under the assumption that, well, or basically the, the atmosphere evolves and we can only switch control on and off. So we want to uh, still compare this relative power gain of two uh, turbines. So the definition is the same. But what we are going to do now is that we have our uh, long uh, LES time series. So here is shown in black is our baseline with no yawing and in red is uh, is our yawing with minus 30 degrees and this is the total power of the two turbines basically what we're going to do is split our time series into 10 minute periods of uh, of normal operation that gives us for instance the the black line here with a certain power and then we have a transition period where we might where we could imagine that we switch control to a, to a yawing to get the red line here. And then what we want to do is cross compare these two periods where the flow is not the same, the underlying flow is not the same, but we want to do this uh, cross comparison between the, the, the periods. And we can do that both forwards with the blue arrows and backwards with the green arrows uh, where we compare the, the, the baseline. <clears throat> so if we do that, we can uh, generate uh, figures similar as before. Again, these uh, box plots, uh, of the power gain versus uh, downstream distance, we have plotted the idealized distributions in uh, in the black boxes, and then we have overlaid it with the uh, colored uh, box plots for these um, for this realistic scenario where we where we do the cross comparison. So when we compare here, we can see that generally the the distributions are quite comparable. The, the true or the idealized uh, distributions are generally encapsulated by our, uh, our realistic or our toggle distributions, which are wider um, here, which I guess makes sense because we have a larger uncertainty. We're, different, we're comparing different uh, scenarios. And this also goes for the other uh, atmospheric cases where generally the, the distributions are, are, are comparable and the true distributions are encapsulated by the the, these toggle distributions. So again, you see the black uh, distributions here are fit within the, 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 the colored ones. However, there is a risk we can see of both false negatives and particular false positives when we do this uh, toggling. So over here for the conventional neutral boundary layer cases, there is a number of cases, particularly the outliers when we move further downstream where we see false negatives. So we could think that we lose power where we actually wouldn't lose power and much worse on the right hand side there is some cases for the um, for the convective boundary layers where we actually if we were doing toggle tests that we would be able to see significant false positive of up to five or even ten percent power gains where we would actually not not uh, see any in uh, if we knew everything for uh, with the background or the, the baseline so that's of course uh, a concern so that concludes the, the talk, but uh, basically what we have tried to do is to compare the statistical distributions of, of toggle tests and wind farms um, for different uh, atmospheric uh, stabilities. We have compared these idealized distributions where we know everything, compared them to toggle distributions, and we see that, that the idealized are encapsulated by the toggle distributions, which are typically wider. And this widened uh, distributions that gives a risk of both false and uh, and false false negative and uh, false positive uh, results. For the future work, we uh, would like to uh, have our distributions converge because they are basically just based on these uh, 90 minutes of simulation time. So we would like to have longer time series, and we can either do that by running LES longer, 
or we could use our recently developed uh, stochastic generator, the, our reduced auto model that has a, a stochastic engine uh, to generate more and more uh, seeds with the right spectral statistics. Uh, so that will enable us to, to get longer time series. We would also like to compare this for longer statistics. So instead of these 10 minutes, because of course the uncertainty uh, in 10 minutes is high, we could compare for say 30 minutes or one hour. But of course, since uh, since the stable and the convective boundary layers are still de uh, developing, that might also be a trade-off between how long should we actually do our statistics over compared to how, how uh, transient is the underlying flow. And then uh, obviously also uh, compare for different roughnesses, geostrophic winds and uh, different temperature forcings. But uh, that was my uh, presentation. Are there any questions or points to discuss? Yeah, thanks a lot. So that was very interesting. Um, yeah, question from Julian. I you are muted. Might be muted. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? So does this work better? Yes. Okay, Hi, thanks. Hi. Um, thanks for well, thanks a bunch for this really nice lecture. Really nice, interesting work. We, we've in our group, we've been talking a lot about how this toggling in different conditions and temporal, you know, you know limited time data can can lead to uncertainty. And we've also been talking about how measurement errors can lead to uncertainty. So I, I've seen some interesting work where people will put like a synthetic wind vane or LIDAR in, in their simulation and pretend they were actually measuring. I mean, how, how hard would it be to extend this to have some sort of synthetic measurements that are kind of comparable to what we might really be measuring in a, in a test campaign? Um, that would be relatively easy. I mean, the turbines that we simulate, also the ghost turbines, they essentially have a, an anemometer, you could say, at, uh, at hop height. So we have already a, a wind speed and a wind direction estimate that we could use. But we also have the capability of uh, introducing a numerical LIDAR. We haven't done it for these simulations, but uh, we have done it before, so we have the capability to do that. It would be the coolest study. All right, uh, question from Matthias. Yes, hello, son. Uh, question on this was run for a, a one continuous uh, direction. So we have uncertainty in the direction, but you do not have from multiple angles. So you have no your control on the turbine. It's just purely static, right? No, exactly. So so that's, of course, a, uh, you could say a problem for the second turbines, the ghost turbines, because they would adjust slightly Typically, what we have seen before is that if you if you do include that, then then the second turbine would typically yaw plus minus uh, about sorry it would yaw plus and it would yaw about I don't know three to five degrees or something like that when you're yawing a turbine and that can you can also see that in the power production. Yeah, and then my next question is also uh, uh, these for offshore conditions uh, you you tr you should try to cover let's say a broad range of. Uh, conditions here, just roughly speaking, what percentages of these three different uh, conditions would you roughly see in, let's say, it's for sake of argument, the North Sea? Yeah, I don't have any statistics on that, sorry. I'll have to log in to something. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know top of my head. Okay, fair enough. But I mean, these are quite extreme cases, like they are based on the, the gables uh, and what is the other one? Uh, they're, they're quite extreme uh, cases, as far as I remember these uh, atmospheric conditions. So they're they're probably not your standard ones. No, okay. It's also of course I saw three percent turbulence intensity and just yeah. uh, a bit curious. Yeah. But regardless, very interesting. Yeah, one question I had. So uh, when you were 
<clears throat> showing the results with the false positives and false negatives. Those were those points were just individual 10 minute periods that you were um, yes. de de determining the power gain from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so if, we talked a lot internally. If this uh, ten-minute period is, of course, a short period, right? So, uh, so statistic might converge more if we if we do it over longer. But as I also indicated in the talk, that you know some of these uh, the stable and the conven the convective uh, they are still developing, right? So, if there's an underlying trend, maybe that uh, develops more. So we shouldn't average over one hour either. And that is really what we set out to also compare how long should you do this statistics over. But one and a half hour is too little to really investigate if we need 20 minutes or 30 minutes because we have very few samples then. Right. Yeah. And have you thought about looking at the maybe just stay with 10 minute averaging periods, but um, look at averaging different numbers of periods together to get these statistics. So. Um, OK, no, we haven't discussed that, but that's a good idea um, that we could average over multiple uh, periods. But again, we have we are limited by the 90 minutes, so we are really considering how to expand this database with the least amount of computational cost, you could say. And there that's where our stochastic generator uh, could help. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what the what the uncertainty in these power gain estimates look like as a function yeah. of the sampling period or number of samples that are averaged. Yeah, for sure. And I think it, it's also, you know, LES is always we try to mimic the atmospheric condition, but it's all of course always idealized under assumptions of, for instance, Moninopukov, et cetera. You know, so it can only give an indication of what kind of uncertainty can we expect in the in the real atmosphere. 